Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in response to the colloquy that just transpired, I would simply say that for all of the earnest and I'm sure sincere spirit uh, behind it, there's no willingness to even close one corporate tax loophole to support our nation's defense, which I think puts into some context the priority in which that's held as a practical matter as opposed to a theoretical matter. But I've come to the floor today to urge this chamber to wake up to the urgent threat of climate change. I've done this every week that the Senate is in session for nearly three years. Today is my 94th time. I've asked my colleagues to heed the warnings from our scientists, from our military and national security professionals, from many of our leading American corporations and executives, from their own home state universities, and from so many of our faith leaders. Since it's budget week, we would do well to also consider that for years, the Government Accountability Office has placed climate change on its biennial high-risk list of the greatest fiscal challenges facing the federal government. But even so, there's no attention from the other side. This risk is particularly great in coastal areas, like in my home state of Rhode Island where sea levels rise ever closer to infrastructure and property, and extreme weather exacts an ever heavier toll. Secretary of the Treasury Liu put it pretty plainly, if the fiscal burden from climate change continues to rise, it will create budgetary pressures that will force hard trade-offs, larger deficits or higher taxes. And these trade-offs would make it more challenging to invest in growth, to meet the needs of an aging population, and to provide for our national defense. My Republicans want, my Republican colleagues want to slash spending. Indeed, they have almost a fixation on slashing spending. They say that they do not want to leave a financial mess for future generations to bear. But they ignore the need to slash our carbon emissions and don't care a bit about leaving an environmental mess for future generations to bear. They refuse because the polluters and their allies have built a fearsome political machine since Citizens United, and the polluters demand that Republicans follow their denier script. Well, unfortunately, nature won't wait for our politics to sort themselves out. And nowhere are these changes occurring more clearly than in our oceans. The changes in our oceans are real, and they are measurable. They follow the laws of biology, of chemistry, and of physics. Our steady flood of carbon pollution has real consequences. Scientists from the University of California, Stanford, and Rutgers recently published a peer-reviewed paper in Science Magazine on marine defaunation. Defaunation is a big word for the widespread loss of animal life in the ocean. Human activities, they argue, including overfishing, pollution, and carbon emissions, are wiping out sea life. Populations of marine vertebrates including seabirds and mammals and turtles, have de decreased by an average of 22 percent over the last 40 years. Fish have declined by nearly 40 percent. Major fish species have crashed 90 percent. Coral is having massive bleaching and die-off. We are living, the authors say, in a time of, and I'll quote them, empty reefs, empty estuaries, and empty bays. How is it 
that carbon pollution changes the ocean environment? Pretty simply, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap heat. That's not news. We've known that since Abraham Lincoln was president. And much of that heat goes right into the ocean. Globally, the oceans absorb more than 90% of the heat captured by greenhouse gases. Well, all that heat disrupts marine life. Corals, for example, will expel the algae living in their tissues when water is too warm, causing the coral to turn completely white and die in what's known as coral bleaching. Other species that aren't stuck in one place like coral are literally swimming away. We've seen fish accustomed to specific temperatures migrating to cooler waters. Along the entire northeast seaboard, the movement of fish further north and to deeper waters is well documented. NOAA has even developed tools to allow fisheries managers and scientists to go online and track the movements of different species through time. I've had fishermen back home tell me they're catching fish their fathers and grandfathers never saw come up in their nets. As one Rhode Island fisherman told me, Sheldon, it's getting weird out there. 40% of fishermen in the Northeast reported catching new fish species in places where they wouldn't expect to find them in a recent Center for American Progress survey. Among them, those who believed climate change is happening outnumber deniers by four to one. Just last week, the Providence Journal, my home state paper, reported on the continuing loss of the ice smelt from the waters of the Northeast. The smelt lives in estuaries and bays in the wintertime, making it, once upon a time, a favorite for ice fishermen. But now, where the ice fishing cottages used to cover the ice, there are very few. That fishery has crashed. In Narragansett Bay, the winter flounder fishery has crashed. From Maine comes a recent Newsweek article by our former Republican colleague Olympia Snow. It's titled rather bluntly, Lack of Action on Climate Change is Costing Fishing Jobs. Senator Snow reports that the shrimp fishery in the Gulf of Maine was closed this winter for the second year in a row because the shrimp are nowhere to be found. The shrimp fishery has crashed, and the crash has been precipitous. As recently as 2010, shrimpers in the Gulf of Maine hauled in 12 million pounds of northern shrimp. By the time they had to close the fishery, the catch was down to less than 600,000 pounds. One likely culprit is warming seas. The Gulf of Maine is at the southern end of the shrimp's range, and the Gulf of Maine is warming exceptionally fast. An estimate from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute shows that water temperatures in the Gulf rose eight times faster than the global average in recent years. The rapid changes in the Gulf of Maine are causing things to get strange for the other fisheries as well. Our colleague Angus King has come to the floor repeatedly to describe the northward march of the iconic Maine lobster. Cod populations in the Gulf of Maine suffered for years from overfishing. Now the cod are struggling to recover as temperatures in the Gulf increase. The cod might not return, instead seeking out cooler water elsewhere. Another scientific fact, warmer temperatures make oxygen less soluble in water. Where oxygen is too low for marine life to flourish, that creates dead zones, which are growing around our oceans in size and in number. If carbon pollution continues at pace, global oxygen levels in the ocean are predicted to drop by more than 3% over the century. Do we tell the fish to hold their breath while we wait to wake up? Carbon pollution also makes the oceans more acidic, another scientific fact. And ocean water has absorbed roughly a quarter of all historic carbon dioxide emissions. 
driving up the pH level of the oceans at rates not seen in perhaps the last 300 million years. To put 300 million years in context, that's more than a thousand times as long as our species has been on this planet. We are gambling with very big changes that we have never seen in human time and that are a long way back in geologic time. Acidifying waters make it harder for animals such as oysters or even the humble pteropod, a main component of the salmon diet, and a lot of other creatures out there at the base of the oceanic food chain to make their shells and develop properly from juveniles to adults. Increasingly, those acidic oceans are hurting U.S. shellfish, and shellfish are a billion-dollar American industry. More acidic waters have already cost the oyster industry in the Pacific Northwest nearly $110 million, putting 3,200 jobs at risk. The Pacific Northwest is being hit first by ocean acidification, but the effects are expected to be felt hardest in the Northeast in my home, according to a recent article in the journal Nature Climate Change. Conditions in the Northeast will jeopardize the $14 million annual mollusk harvest in my state of Rhode Island, putting my home state's coastal communities at real risk of economic harm. Bill Mook, president of Mook Sea Farm in Maine, testified before the Environment and Public Works Committee last summer about the decline in oyster larvae that he's linked to more acidic water. As he said, delicate shellfish hatcheries are, quote, canaries in the coal mine, end quote, the first victims of a growing menace. And yet, Mr. President, we still don't listen. From coast to coast and pole to pole, the oceans are warning us, and we still do not listen. The authors of the Science Magazine paper warned that we are headed into, and I'll quote them, an era of global chemical warfare on the oceans. An era of global chemical warfare on the oceans. And we won't listen. Mr. President, we must wake up to the warnings that are coming from our oceans. The evidence is there for everyone to see. It's a matter of measurement, basic measurement of temperature, of pH, of sea level, real high school science class stuff that are showing us these changes. And yet, we won't listen. Fishermen in Rhode Island and across the country are already feeling these changes. They see them around them. And colleagues, if you're not a scientist, Go ask the coastal and ocean scientists at your home state university. They'll give you the answer. Let me conclude, Mr. President, by going back to what Senator Snow wrote. Quote, the loss of Maine's $5 million shrimp fishery should serve as a warning. A similar blow to our $300 million lobster fishery must be avoided at all costs. That will require honest, fact-based discussion and a genuine bipartisan commitment to solutions. Well, we've had neither around here for a long time. There's been no honest, fact-based discussion, and there's been no bipartisan commitment to solutions. And that has to change. I hope that Senator Snow's fellow Republicans here in the Senate will join with us Democrats in that honest, fact-based discussion and in a genuine bipartisan commitment to solutions. I hope our colleagues will unshackle themselves from the fossil fuel industry, which is an industry riddled with appalling conflicts of interest on this subject, and wake the heck up. Mr. President, I yield the floor.